not going to try not to go over too many things that are redundant that we've gone over before. Um, but I do want to just highlight the examination of Hebrew Light Power and Rocky Mountain Power Joint Transmission Project. Uh, Rocky Mountain Power is Hebrew Light Power's transmission provider. So uh, we do have a distribution system and some sub transmission. <coughs> that serve our substation loads here in the area, but our power projects that are outside the area, um, we use Rocky Mountain Power's transmission system through a transmission agreement to get that energy to us here locally. Um, we have several, we have, you know, um, plenty of energy resources um, in Idaho, Wyoming, and um, different parts of Utah. Uh, we both have franchise agreements with Wasatch County. Uh, we both serve customers in Wasatch County. Um, and in 2012, Heber Light Power requested a new point of delivery from Rocky Mountain Power uh, at the 138 kV voltage. Um, in response to the request, so for create uh, you know, one of the sister companies, Rocky Mountain Power, completed a system impact study. Um, that study determined that the only way Heber Light Power could get another point of delivery is for them to complete the connection from their south system, which comes up Provo Canyon, to their north system, which comes down from the Jordanelle Basin. And uh, currently that's not connected and in order to provide the point of delivery that uh, Heber Light Power needs, it needed to be connected. Um, and then we were also in the process of, you know, planning to rebuild our South 46 KV line. And so uh, in the process of that, we uh, did some needs and necessity um, studies. And, you know, uh, ICP did a study back in 2010, 2011 time frame that said that we were outgrowing our 46 kV system um, at the Midway Interconnect point, which kind of kicked all this stuff off. And we refreshed that study in 2018 uh, at the request of the board and, you know, just the study came back basically saying the same thing. Uh, you know, we don't have enough capacity on our system without rebuilding the south line, and uh, we need to rebuild the current interconnection point with Rocky Mountain Power at, up there in Midway. Um, currently, we take delivery at one location. It's at the Midway uh, interconnection point uh, just up above of the cemetery up there. Uh, we're, pre we're predicting that we'll outgrow that by 2022. And, uh, and during that, you know, Rocky Mountain Power was looking at their stuff. Um, so I'll let Dave look at that. How about just to focus a little bit? Yeah, I don't know. You can go. down. Yeah, so at the, at the same time that uh, there was this uh, point of delivery, second point of delivery study, Rocky Mountain Power was looking at their system along the Wasatch back, and uh, we have customers. Uh, I guess the end user customers on the north end of the valley here, as well as on in the Wallsburg area. Uh, and, uh, and then Keeper Light Power is also uh, our largest customer in, in this area. And to be able to serve them reliably, we need to uh, connect the, uh, the area transmission lines. It's the 138 KV lines. Yes? It, just so I'm clear, did, when you say you have end user customers, that means Wallsburg doesn't go through if you were like that's that. correct and there are other where on the north end of the valley here also well. it's not yours it's directly correct 
You build on them. Okay. Thanks. Correct. Okay. Yeah. In addition, we wield power for Hebrew Light and Power. Right. Um, and so you know, the, regionally, this power is transmitted across these transmission lines. And it's important, um, you know, from our perspective, that the real need drivers behind this project are, are two. And I've got to summarize them or look at in more detail on the screen. But in summary, uh, it's reliability. If there were an outage on either the north lines that come into the valley or the south lines, there's no way that we can pick up all of the load in this region without putting these lines through in a loop configuration. Um, the, other, the other side of this is the new load itself, the load's getting high enough that to serve on one single point of delivery, we need to have a loop configuration. So those are the two main drivers for our power. Okay, uh, so Doug mentioned that um, we we got four new members of our Heber Light and Power Board uh, at the beginning of 2018. Uh, so we we really, you know, the board really wanted to, you know, make sure that this project was necessary. And, uh, you know, previous boards hadn't, um, you know, just rubber stamped it. So. Uh, they, they form a facilities committee review. They do that every year. Um, Heber, Midway, and Wasatch County all have representation on that committee. Uh, the committee reviewed the need and necessity. Uh, the committee reviewed the route. Uh, the committee reviewed the cost difference between overhead and underground based on uh, a study done by NEI. Uh, the com committee reviewed every structure, type, and location pretty much throughout the route. And the committee made recommendations to the Heber Light and Power Board. Uh, some of the changes the committee made to the prior proposed line was to remove distribution, distri the distribution underbill through various sections. Uh, that, that was, you know, that's gonna be a cost on ratepayers. It's not cheap to um, take all that distribution off and put it in the ground, but it does it does really mitigate the impact on this transmission line. You know, there's um, getting rid of that distribution, putting it in the ground, gets rid of a lot of lines. So, thank you. So I just put it in. Uh, the committee also, you know, recommended that we use wood poles on all the standard patches. <coughs> uh, you know, that there's not always a standard tangent as you're following a fence line, uh, but, you know, you use wood poles whenever you can um, in the construction. Uh, they also they also requested that you know the committee or commissions like you guys um, consider allowing height so the spans can be as long as possible, which equates to fewer poles. Uh, it's just you know a recommendation to commissions like you all. Um, uh, they want dull non-specular wire, non-specular conductor used. And they uh, wanted to relocate the point of delivery substation from an area by the Wasatch County <coughs> Event Center. Um, and we were able to find that, that property on 650 South to, to make that happen. Uh, wood or wood colored cross arm where, where needed uh, was another recommendation from the committee. Uh, so after the committee had several meetings, um, and there were plenty of them, uh, it, it went to the full Heber Light and Power Board. And through this time, the Heber Light and Power Board uh, confirmed the need of the new, new point of delivery from the bulk electric system. Uh, they examined why Heber Light and Power is doing the project with Rocky Mountain Power. Uh, the board evaluated the cost of taking all or part of the line underground and what the rate impact of such action would be. 
Uh, the board evaluated the transmission line route, and the board has had several public meetings where they have taken public comment throughout this process. Approved. At, at the end of all that, the board approved by board action moving forward with an overhead line and to diligently work with any entity that is willing to pay to take any section of the line underground. Uh, completed studies in uh, April, we uh, did the feasibility study, the cost feasibility study analysis. Uh, NEI Power Engineering out of Colorado did that did that work uh, in June 8, in 2018. Uh, we refreshed the Heberlite Power 46 kV load flow study, and Intermountain Professional Engineers Incorporated out of Salt Lake did that analysis. And in July 2018, Heberlite and Power's electric load and energy <coughs> forecast was done by Utility Financial Solutions out of Michigan. Uh, the forecast pretty much confirmed that uh, we are outgrowing our system at a very rapid rate and that we need to upgrade our 46 kV system interconnect point as well as complete the <coughs> rebuild of the south 46 kV line. That kind of walk through this before, um, I don't want to belabor this, but essentially we pick up at uh, the southern end of the old Highway 40, uh, just south of Jordan L Reservoir, uh, and we follow along the east side of the road, there's a distribution, uh, there are a couple of distribution lines there, they're going to be consolidated on, on one single monopole line of poles that runs down the east side of Highway 40, the old Highway 40, where it crosses to the south side, there's a distribution line on the south side of Highway 32. We follow that distribution line down uh, where we turn and then, and then continue on the east side of Highway 40 to where it, it, it connects to the existing transmission line uh, that turns up to what's known as college substation over by the Campus. What are these numbers? Are they poles? Those are those are pole pole numbers. Yeah, and the transmission model that we created, and you know, Doug alluded to this a, a little bit. We have, uh, you know, there, there's a, there's an either or question to answer here. Do you either want shorter poles that are closer together, or do you want fewer poles that are taller? Um, and so. You know, we, we've done enough engineering to know this is where we want the line to go, but before we go through and do final engineering, we would like some direction from the county as, as to what their preference is. And I can talk a little bit more about, about that, but this would be our, our standard design on, on where poles would be along this route. Uh, again, the bypass corridor. Uh, in the staff report, it, it talked about needing to coordinate with uh, DOT on this, we certainly will continue to coordinate with DOT. One of the drivers behind us siting north and west of, of the planned bypass corridor is that they weren't sure where it was going to go. And so we coordinated on right wood widths and, and setbacks and all of those things at that time and determined with them that this is this would be out of the way no matter what happened. We will continue to coordinate with them. Uh, as as those those plans develop, ultimately we need this line now, though. So like you know, they've, they've got their studies; they're going to do those, but we've cited it, so it's out of the way. Uh, we we come down um, and cross 113, um, and then we follow the west side of Southfields Road until we reach uh, Heberlein Power's north line, where we turn and go two spans to the west and then again follow the future bypass corridor route uh, down to 650 South. Uh, some of that is actually within Keeper City jurisdiction, but you can see with the pole numbers where the, the poles would be. Uh, where we turn again on 650, follow the South Line out of the West, there's a point of delivery substation. You can see where the cursor is, kind of here on the southern edge of the uh, Riley Crooks uh, former property there on 650. Um, the line continues, crosses the river, 
falls along the south side of the, the sewer ponds. Um, I don't remember if there was Commissioner Hendricks who asked the question why the purple, there's a purple line that kind of came up around the sewer field. I, I don't know why there's a remnant of some former line. The existing line actually does this upside down U. And so as part of this application, we're just straightening that out. That, that's what this is. The green line continues uh, on in the midway. Uh, you can see the structure number that's there. Where it picks up again. Out of an abundance of caution, we, we showed that at Bend County. Um, we're not sure if that right of way is exactly in the middle of the road or not, but uh, we we'll wait for that point. Um, uh oh. Should still be there. Oh, here we go. Uh, looks like it's loading. Try one more time. It's all down, but it's going to come on. Well, okay, you can see that now. So on the north side of this sheet is 650 south. Um, the structure, the home, and other, other buildings you can see up here on the upper right-hand corner of that property. We've got the, the concepts of the substation is, is further set back off of 650. Uh, there will be lines, obviously, coming in and out of these substations. Um, and I say substation. You know, to the outside viewer, it might just look like one big substation, but one of them is rocking on power, so the delivery where the power is delivered to your like power, and then they transmit their electricity <coughs> on their transmission lines. Uh, this is a rendering uh, looking, looking east. Well, actually, this is just a photo. <laughs> this is a photo looking east on 113th South. Uh, Southfields Road is um, kind of in the background there. And then we have a rendering of that same view with a transmission line that's being proposed. Um, here is looking uh, generally south on Highway 40, on the west side of Highway 40 at the intersection of 40 and 32. Uh, existing conditions. Uh, this is with the transmission line. It's the rendering of what that would look like. Um, this is. Uh, on highway, so I, I, I'm not sure where we are, looking across the, the north of the hills, um, looking to the, the southwest. Uh, and you can see the, the transmission line uh, in that rendering. Uh, high level construction timeline phase one and two are done. That's what's been constructed along Highway 40. Phase three, we really need to get uh, our approvals from local jurisdictions to be able to finalize our design, order longly material and, uh, and get construction started to get this project pushed through. Uh, so discussion, uh, or Doug, I think he did a great job walking through this. Um, and, and this slide is actually made specifically to address a question that we had during the work session uh, on, on this project. One of the questions that we had was, if you were to follow, wait, what, what, why are you even here? If you, if you could do something to make this line fit the code, how, you know, how would you go about doing that? Um, so this is the actual section of the Wasatch County Code. And because of the voltages we're talking about, 138 and 46, there's really no way to actually you know, build this line without a conditional use permit. But if we were to hypothetically say, OK, well, if we're going to try to keep poles below 49 feet, what would that look like? So kind of following the spirit of it. Um, and a little background on, on this. Uh, you know, Doug would do this as well. You know, ultimately what we're trying to do is control the conductor at its least controlled spot. So that's where it's hanging the lowest, you know, farthest fan out. So that's 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 usually the, the control point. So it's ground to, to to that lowest conductor from a structure, from a tree, from you know, <coughs> access roadway. And so uh, you know if, if you think about that and say, okay, well if we have longer spans, then obviously those poles have to be taller because they're they're hanging off the insulator at higher elevation. But mid-span, it's still controlled. That's the controlling point from NESC. Uh, so in order to get 
poles that are extremely short, say 49 feet, we have to go to a non-standard design. And I really, we are not suggesting we do this. We were just asked to, to say, what would this look like? Well, what it would look like is three separate lines of poles with just two insulators on them. that are shorter poles, but there's poles every 150 feet instead of every 300 feet or you know, 350 feet. So there's a lot more poles. You have a 95 foot right of way, you've got really strung out. And we, we did a three, to about three per well. Yeah. Wow. To, <clears throat> this is hyperbole. I mean, I, it, we're, we're not suggesting we do this, this is non standard, but I'm just saying that to answer the question that was asked directly, this is what it would look like. We don't think this is what you know, really meets the, the spirit or, or intent of what you're looking for. Adding, adding not that you need to pile on this, it's a non-standard design, and so if the county were to say, we want you to build this, the difference in cost between that and a, and a standard design uh, would actually be, be borne by the requesting party, the county in this case. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's one of the reasons why the, the polls work the way that they do. Uh, and, and really that's one of the questions that uh, I think that this commission is going to have to answer for themselves is, what, what do you value? Do you want shorter poles that, and, and more of them? Or do you want the most efficient design possible? Uh, Jason uh, mentioned that the, the board recommended to him fewer poles uh, that fall within this, the standard range. So that, that was what the board recommended. The other reason why we're here is uh, the same section of the code, uh, 4814 electric substations require conditional use permit. Uh, Doug mentioned, uh, mentioned this log through it, but uh, 1727A506, subsection 2A1, you can, uh, a land use authority shall approve a conditional use if reasonable conditions are proposed or can be imposed to mitigate reasonably anticipated detrimental effects of the proposed use in accordance with standards. And then uh, the very next part, the requirement, uh, is to reasonably mitigate, it, mitigate anticipated detrimental effects that the proposed conditional use does not necessarily mean elimination. Uh, a couple other things. Uh, conditions may be imposed to mitigate the reasonably anticipated detrimental effects in accordance with applicable standards. So there's a measuring tape on those standards. The imposition of reasonable conditions is to achieve compliance with those standards, with whatever that measuring stick is. And detrimental effect must be measured against the applicable standard to achieve compliance with that standard. So a couple of things that were mentioned, and Jason, I don't know if you, you know, can I kind of. So uh, in December 2017, several things were, were discussed. One of them was, you know, how, how does a project like this fit in with the vision or, or purpose of the county? Um, and we, we have the language on the vision and purpose there. You know, our, interpret our interpretation of this, you know, manage the impacts of growth. We obviously have growth. We have low growth. We have a need for this project. Strive to balance preservation of, of areas rural and agricultural. Promote economic, residential, recreational, tourism development opportunities. Reliable and sufficient power certainly facilitates that. Um, without this project, we don't have the critical electrical services to the county. You're going to suffer liability issues, capacity limitations, et cetera. Um, you know, there was some discussion regarding the, the impact on rural character of the overhead transmission line. I, I don't think any evidence has been provided to say that an overhead transmission line hurts rural character. And in fact, as an operator of transmission lines throughout the West, I, I don't know of any rural area that has very transmission lines and, you know, we, we own and maintain and operate. Sorry, so who's the ROA? Whose motion is this? Th this, was, this was the Planning Commission's. What's an ROA? Uh, going through the 10 conditional use permit standards um, <coughs> complies with all requirements of the, the title, we believe we do. Uh, maintain a business license, I don't believe that's applicable, but if it is, we, we can obtain one. Use is compatible with surrounding structures and use. We, we don't see that the project will affect any <coughs> use, location, scale, mass, design, or circulation. Um, as far as visual and safety impacts, our projects are designed to meet all of the required safety standards. Uh, visual impacts, uh, 
you know, we reduced pole heights by putting some distribution lines underground. Uh, we tried to use wood poles where possible instead of using galvanized, we used uh, this called rusted steel, the self-weathering steel poles. Um, we tried to incorporate uh, whatever we can. At the end of the day, it's an overhead transmission line, and and you know it is a it is a, a conditional use. We, we have uh, existing facilities within the county that, that do this this exact same purpose. Um, the use is consistent with the general plan. We believe safe, reliable, and adequate affordable electrical service is consistent with the plan. In fact, it's it's absolutely critical for the continuance of the plan. The effect of any future expansion. So your code already kind of covers this, uh, 1623-06D. Uh, uh, if, if we need to make a change, we'd have to be in front of the body again, so you mitigate that uh, through, through a future action. Um, issues of lighting, parking, et cetera, traffic capabilities, uh, other permits. So as far as state and federal environmental requirements, we've gone and obtained everything that we need to obtain for this. I'm not sure what measuring stick we would go and, and pull out to try to obtain additional uh, studies of some sort. Um, we are already held to follow all of those standards, and, and, and we will. And we do not see any issues with lighting, parking, locations, those, those types of concerns. Uh, eight, uh, will not place unreasonable financial burden uh, the way that it's proposed that places no financial burden on the county or surrounding properties uh, will not adversely affect health, safety, or welfare. It's necessary to provide safe, reliable, adequate, and affordable electric service. Um, we believe that that is in the best interest of the county, and we are unaware of any negative health, safety, or welfare impacts. And finally, uh, land use requiring a building permit to conform with the International Uniform Building Code standards. Uh, we believe that's not a uh, couple other things on that report of action, alternative sightings. So other routes that we didn't select are really not necessarily part of this review. We're, we're fine talking about a couple of those that, that we did think about, but that's not really the question that's before the commission. Um, any, that, and, and I think before we talk about alternative sightings, we need to say what are the baseline conditions that need to be met, right? This project is to meet specific conditions. One, one of them is he brought power needs to rebuild their south line from Midway Cemetery uh, over to uh, the uh, College South Station. And a lot of that has been, the, the north, northern portion of that has been done, but the south line substantively still needs to be rebuilt. Um, whether or not this project moves forward, that has to be done. And that will have to be done to meet latest NESC standards. Those pole heights will be taller. You know, it's essentially you have a very similar project that we're talking about. Um, the other thing is he right car needs a second point of delivery to the National Electric Grid. It has to, to deliver that benefit. Rocky Mountain Power needs to connect Midway Substation to Jordan Mountain Substation. 